Thank you all for being here today for this next special talk. I'd like to introduce Matteo Pandarini. He was a former student here at Politecnico di Milano and also at the University of Illinois in Chicago. He is the city of Curio and previously in Lincoln. Um, he's going to provide us an overview on his uh, history and the journey into the entrepreneurship um, in, in, of his entrepreneurship journey in uh, healthcare, wellness, and uh, mindfulness. So, Matteo, thank you so much for joining us for this talk, and I leave the stage to you. Thank you, Marco. It's uh, always great to be back at Polytechnico. Uh, it's good to see you all. Um, so, yeah, today I'm going to talk about a bit about myself. Um, I actually got from you guys a bunch of questions and topics that you would like to hear uh, from me about. Uh, so what I thought I would do is to kind of give you some context about myself, um, break down some of those uh, two or three kind of major categories or topics that you wanted to hear about. I'll touch on those and then I'll give you plenty of time to ask me, you know, questions, Q&A or whatever areas you're interested in diving into more. Um, cool. And uh, feel free to type in the chat along the way if you have questions. Maybe Marco can keep an eye on the chat and summarize the questions for me. Uh, so we can keep it more kind of interactive. Uh, and I'll, I'll speak in English because it's probably easier for this topic. So uh, my name is Matteo. I, uh, I live in San Francisco. I've been here for a while. Um, I'm a founder, engineering leader. Uh, I call myself Mindful Nerd. This is my Substack uh, nickname. Uh, it tries to capture the, you know, my interest in engineering and technology and at the intersection with not only mindfulness, but also wellness and health. Uh, so that's kind of a nickname that I came up with for my uh, for my writings. All right, so quick background about me. I uh, grew up in uh, this city in the north of Italy called Mantova. Um, spent my teenage years actually in the Alps doing a bunch of competitive skiing. Uh, so this is uh, the, the, one of the clearest memory I have is, you know, waiting at the gates with the pressure and some of these strong emotions of kind of fear or anxiety of having to perform and kind of, you know, being there at the gates and... Um, uh, and just being very present and kind of trying to focus on the minute and a half that you have to uh, to actually go down the slope and, and win the race. So that was kind of the early memory. I uh, graduated from, from Polytechnico. This is in Milan uh, with my buddies. And then I uh, ended up in Chicago, uh, actually, you know, thanks to Marco for the most part. And, you know, very grateful for that. Uh, this is us in the, in the lab in Chicago uh, many years ago now. Uh, and uh, ended up doing my thesis in Chicago with working with um, elementary schools. So we built a bunch of software for kids in schools uh, all over Chicago. And uh, worked there for a number of years, uh, worked for a couple of startups. And then I also got into meditation. Uh, that was during the time where I started exploring new things in you know, wellness. I wanted to cultivate more I guess, you know, presence and, and, you know, also being, you know, away from home, kind of dealing with that and dealing with some of those emotions. And I think meditation was a very good, you know, not only set of practices and tools and skills to learn. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk more about that, but that was kind of a big passion that started around that time. Um, decided to move to the Bay Area. I got a job at LinkedIn, moved over, left Chicago, uh, worked, ended up working at LinkedIn for almost six years. Um, when I was there, I worked on a number of different things, but the last three years, I got a chance to start a new product, a new business line within the company. Um, so it was my first time more formally, you know, doing zero to one, almost like a brand new startup or product within the big company. So we had obviously the you know, funding and support of, of the company, but at the same time, uh, we started with, you know, two people, an idea on paper, and we went out and executed on it. Uh, and I, you know, we built out a team of, 20 people over two years or three and, and launched to market. And uh, it was a great experience and it kind of gave me a taste for what doing actually doing startups, uh, you know, feels like. So this is the announcement that we, that we made at the time. This was a B2B kind of SaaS product for, for sales. Um, when I was there on the side, kind of on that theme of uh, mindfulness and emotional intelligence, I, because of this passion, I started teaching and giving classes and workshops around that. Uh, so this is me speaking at one of the workshops at LinkedIn. Um, I paired up with uh, a friend and a mentor. Uh, at the time, he was reporting to the CEO of LinkedIn, uh, Scott Shute. And we, you know, starting from a small gym in South Bay, here in the Bay Area, we created a whole program that today runs across 20 or more different offices around the world. Um, so just, you know, a way to give employees not only time, but the skills uh, to cultivate, you know, not only soft skills, but emotional intelligence, um, self-awareness, 
compassion, how to work with each other, how to share, you know, um, emotions or feelings or uh, receive and give feedback about what's happening at work. Uh, so very helpful work and, you know, just kind of a side gig at that time, but something that I spent a bunch of time on uh, when I was there and also obviously, you know, learned a bunch of public speaking along the way. Um, so fast forward, left LinkedIn, wanted to do my own company, uh, keeping on the theme of, you know, health and wellness and mindfulness. I ran into Hillary. She's a, a physician, doctor, uh, trained at Stanford Medical School. Uh, around that time, it was a time when the most exciting thing in mental health was the approval in the US for the very first psychedelics for uh, treating depression and anxiety. Uh, so we paired up, started working on that problem. The time you felt right, uh, we wanted to do it you know, in the healthcare system with insurance support uh, and getting patients referred through psychiatrists and mental health clinics. So that was the, the plan. Uh, so I set out with Hilary Felix and we hired also Jan, who was the, used to be the head of science at Calm, the, the meditation app before. Um, so that was Curio. Uh, so that was you know quick summary of my life, uh, work and, and personal. Um, what I thought I would do today, based on the questions that you asked me, uh, I'll touch on three areas. One is careers and transitions. A lot of you asked me about you know, what a career kind of journey maybe in Silicon Valley or Bay Area looks like. Um, why did I make the crazy decision of leaving a high paying you know, LinkedIn job and start a company? So I'll touch on that. Um, second, I'll talk about lessons specifically from healthcare and health tech. Uh, I think it's, there's a lot of uh, unique aspects to it compared to traditional tech. Uh, and then I'll talk about maybe my trends or things that I'm excited about. So, you know, I talk to a lot of startups in the Bay Area and, you know, monitor the ecosystem so I can tell you the things that I'm most excited about. Does, it, does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just want to well, say about the logistics. Do you prefer to be interrupted during your presentation or um, everything at the end? Um, I would say maybe, why don't you drop questions in the chat and then at the end we can touch on, on all of them so I can try to summarize the main Okay. My area. Does that sound good? Cool. And how many of you are CS, computer engineering science, and how many are biotech? How many CS? Computer engineering? Yeah. Okay. Two, three. How many bio, biotech, bioengineering? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. Just have a sense for, for the room. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, I come more from the software side, but I, I have a bunch of insights in, in bio as well. Um, okay, so when I think about careers, so I start from careers. Um, yeah, obviously, what I learned in the last at least decade here in the Bay Area, um, when I think about it, it's obviously you and the market, right? And you bring um, experience, skills, knowledge, uh, strengths that you build over time, your values, your goals, uh, and your interests, and, 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 and the pools that you feel towards different, it could be you know, technologies or domains or areas of expertise. Um, and then you, you know, constantly interact with the market and the market is ever changing and it's, you know, supply and demand It's ruled by supply and demand. It's talent flows. It's people moving from company to company or idea to idea or startup to startup. Um, uh, right now, for example, you know, historically, uh, you know, these last two years with the you know, AI boom in, in the Bay Area, companies like OpenAI is growing like crazy, right? Uh, four years ago, they were doing similar work, but 1% of people knew about them, right? Uh, so that keeps changing all the time and the skills required for that keep changing all the time. Um, if you look at the salaries or the, the total comp for AI researchers or uh, engineers today compared to four years ago or pre GPT, order of magnitude difference, right? Uh, they're the most paid engineers right now. Um, and it's possible that in two years that'll change. it will get, you know, commoditized, people are learning these skills. I'm studying these skills too, even if I don't come strictly from a machine learning background. Um, so, you know, talent changes and, and, and supply and demand changes all the time, very fast. Um, tech innovations and cycles, you know, this is the AI boom before it was crypto, before it was web and mobile. Um, industry trends, competition, obviously, and macroeconomy, you know, that's been kind of the, the major topic of the last few years with uh, you know, interest rates being high and trying to, you know, deal with inflation, uh, companies cutting down, simplifying processes and costs, cutting costs, uh, some of them, many of them doing layoffs. Uh, and that creates a very competitive market, right? Right now, at least in the Bay Area, but I hear even in Singapore and other places, um, you know, very few jobs 
a lot of people trying to fill those gaps, uh, a lot of competition, very hard to get into the market. Um, two or three years ago, it was completely the opposite. Or, you know, pre-COVID, it was even, even, even way so much better. It was, you know, 10x better than now. So today is probably one of the worst markets I've seen in my career. Um, so, you know, there's so always, always this exchange between you and the market and the feedback that you get from the market. So as you see things moving and changing and time moving, the question is, you know, how can you um, respond to that or, or um, move your interests towards areas that, you know, maybe have more market pool, but also seeing forward that you don't want to only uh, overfit for the current trend right now, but maybe uh, making your placing your bets on what, you know, future trend could be in a few years from now. So that's what you try to do, especially in startups. Um, there's this amazing book from Reid uh It's called The Startup of You. And the main idea is to see your career almost like building a startup, right? So um, you are, see yourself as the entrepreneur of your journey. It's a, it's a journey fraught with, um, you know, competition and changing markets and you have to find your own niche or areas of interest within the market. Uh, you have to place bets and some of them will work and most of them will not work. Um, and so this is a book that was actually used to be, maybe it still is, uh, given to every single LinkedIn employee that joins the company. Uh, and, you know, Reed Hoffman was the founder of LinkedIn. Uh, so very interesting kind of take on how to see careers um, and how to plan for them and, um, and and how to not plan for them and, you know, how to keep them, maybe keep the view to the next two years, but not try to over plan for the next decade when, you know, uh, a lot of things will shift and it'll be hard for you to uh, to really plan for, for those long-term kind of changes. Um, so keeping on that theme and analogy, I guess, um, I, th I think, you know, most successful careers are non-linear. Uh, I think, you know, as humans, we always like to think in linear terms and, you know, imagine the careers that are kind of very straight. Um, and this is a cool chart from Lenny's newsletter. This is actually an amazing blog that I highly recommend, but um, it's for product managers, but I think for all of you in, in tech, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, this is on finding product market fit, and it shows in, you know, how many years it took for some of the most successful companies today to even found, find the initial glimpse of, you know, clarity on market traction and market fit, right? Uh, I think Figma took five years. Uh, so I think keeping on the analogy of you and your career as a startup, um, I think it's interesting to see yourself as, you know, continuously pivoting, iterating, finding new ideas, learning new skills, and, and seeing how your career, you know, matches to the market and, and responds to it. Um, and and there will be, you know, many people on the way and uh, same thing that the companies do. Uh, so I think that was a, interesting analogy there um so you know under that lens when i look at my career and uh my career you know it's relatively short at this point so i'll just share kind of the main pivotal points uh but looking back the way i think about it is okay there's probably at least like three uh these like three arrows three major kind of pivotal moments where i could have kept on the trajectory right but i decided to make a big bet and and take a big swing, right? Uh, so one of them was moving to Chicago, and right? Without the, obviously, you know, uh, sacrifices and trade-offs that come with that. Um, the other one was leaving my life in Chicago and, and friends and, and move to, to the Bay Area, right? Uh, and then the other one was probably even um, a bigger transition, you know, launch, launching this new product within a big company, um, you know, trajectory for being a senior leader, manager within a big tech company. Uh, leaving all of that you know, stability and, and compensation and jump into a startup, right? Um, so just to give you an idea of, uh, you know, how to place back best and think about it. And so when I look at this career kind of trajectory for me, um, it's all about this, um, how to make and how to think about making tough career decisions. Um, and so to me, it's almost like two different areas. One is, this is what Jeff Bezos talked about, which is, you know, minimizing regrets, especially when you're, you know, 80 years old and looking back and maybe not having taken as many bats as you could have. Uh, so that for me, that was a big part of, of especially the last one, right? Like this shift um, into startups was finding, feeling that the timing was right uh, in terms of, you know, uh, healthcare regulation and, and new approaches to therapy and, and, and the mission and, you know, the, the, the area that I was interested in, which was mental health. Uh, and then at the same time, the third factor for me was finding the right people and building the right team, right? So the, the you know, starting, obviously, initial team and the founder market fit is, you know, the third component that's, that's very relevant. So for me, uh, minimizing regret at that time was aligning 
my career with my personal kind of values and interests and, you know, the work in mindfulness and mental health and giving people better tools for, uh, for dealing with mental health. Um, so jumping at that mission at the right time or, you know, betting on that being the right time and finding the right team. Um, the growth mindset of w being curious and wanting to learn as much as possible. Um, and then the grit, uh, grit, you know, this famous book talks, talks about passion and perseverance. Uh, I think it's a big part of it. Um, but I think when people talk about grit, they only talk about, you know, sticking to the plan and uh, persevering for a long time, potentially without um, criteria for when to quit or exit. So that's why I always like to pair um, the grit side and, uh, and the, you know, taking the big swings and the big bad sides with uh, the idea of, of, of quitting, but not only quitting, uh, you know, having some plan for how to deal with that, right? Uh, and so when I think about planning, uh, to me, it's always about, you know, being pragmatic about the, the big swing or transition that you're facing. Um, I think this changes all the time based on your stage in life. Uh, the big uh, transition I, or decision I took when I transitioned out of LinkedIn into startups, um, I was able to make, you know, two years ago at the time. Um, five years from now, could have been a completely different, you know, financial situation, family situation, uh, so many different constraints. It's not a decision that can be made in the, in the, in the void, but, you know, it needs to consider all of your um, constraints and optimization functions at the time. So I think that's very important. Uh, and so planning for that, I think, means considering all of these, you know, two or three main kind of objective functions that you have at the right time, but also to set up some, uh, I call them kill criteria or exit criteria, which are um, really, you know, the assumptions that you make on when would be, and this, you do this work, you know, ahead of time before making the decision, what are the criteria for success and what does it look like if this thing is not working, a plan B for, you know, either going back or changing or, or quitting the thing that I decided to do, especially if it's a big bat or something that I'm validating or trying, right? Um, so I think that's very important and it helps with, um, you know, when you're, when you're in the, the thick of the problems and maybe a startup, um, it's very easy to be to suffer from, you know, some cost fallacy and uh, deciding to, to invest a lot more time when you invested already, you know, a few years of your, of your work, when clearly potentially, you know, the traction is not there, the market is not giving you the right inputs. So I think I've been and reassessing over time continuously those criteria for, for when is the right time to exit, I think is very important. Uh, so this is an amazing book that just actually came out in the last couple of years. Um, I very highly recommend. I think it helps you uh, learn how to think in expected value uh, from a you know, game theoretical kind of perspective and how to think in bats and how to place those bats. Uh, I think it's a very good skill to have and uh, maybe under appreciated compared to just talking about, you know, passion and perseverance, which I think is more common. Okay. I'll pause for a second. The last one on career that I have before we move on is this idea, uh, which I think has been very relevant for me. Uh, this one comes from Scott Adams, uh, the creator of Dilbert. Uh, and basically what he says is, you know, to build some of the most successful careers, you probably have like two main ways. One is, you become the best at one specific thing. And the other one is you become very good, like top 25% at two or more of those things. And you kind of position yourself at the intersection of those. Um, and, and there's no right or wrong. I think, you know, both ways work. Uh, becoming best at one is obviously very, very hard to do. Um, in my case, looking back, I think the, the first one is the one that resonates with me, which is, you know, started from a career in software over time, kind of resonated with, leadership, moving to management and, you know, kept building and, you know, coding and learning technical skills as well. Uh, but then found this very strong pull with entrepreneurial efforts, especially within, you know, established companies initially, um, learn how to do zero to one, you know, how to create something new, even within a big company um, and, and learn, you know, the skills required to do that, which are quite different from um, scaling or, or building, you know, software and product at a, at a very large company. Uh, and then on top of that, try to align my career to my personal values of, you know, wanting to teach people and, and help people cultivate uh, mindfulness and, um, and self-awareness and, and, and on top of that, you know, wellness and health. And so kind of moving into health tech and learning that domain, which is very interesting and I'll talk about in a second. 
Um, and then in the last few years, also kind of, you know, learning more about AI. And, and I think this intersection for me is currently like right now is the one that, and for which I see more market pool. For example, for my, you know, next career move, most likely um, the companies that I would maybe want to start or work at are probably at the intersection of me being, you know, mildly good at all of these things put together, right? Um, so that's the way I see it. Hopefully it's helpful, uh, you know, um, some people are able to get very good at one specific thing. Uh, for me, I I'm, see myself more of a generalist and I like to to combine a bunch of different, you know, in the domain expertise in areas that, I, that I'm passionate about. Um, okay, I'll pause for a second. I can take maybe one question just to break kind of the flow. If anyone has anything on career that, you know, strongly resonated with you. I guess you have a question, don't you? Yes, I have uh, posted a question on the, the chat, but uh, probably you already answered uh, a bit. There is uh, one point that I wanted uh, to, to stress uh, is, uh, is it valued in uh, large companies, in uh, large corporates, uh, the startup experience? So uh, the you you told uh, you told us that, that uh, you went from a big company <laughs> such as LinkedIn uh, to a startup environment. So this is uh, for sure <laughs> difficult to uh, drop off. But for someone that has uh, the opposite uh, uh, experience, uh, is it uh, building a startup then a relevant uh, uh, expertise that could be then leveraged in a company, or is it uh, something that is uh, way off, is a parallel road, and uh, it's not valued at all? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Amazing question. Um, very good question. So I'm actually, you know, I'm actually going through that right now. I um, We decided to sell the startup. I'm moving on and talking to, you know, potentially leadership roles within larger companies. Um, uh, I'm actually leveraging a lot of that. So the, the answer to your question is, you know, exactly what I'm going through now. Um, is um, yes, I think you know, probably the 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 most important learnings from doing a startup are, I mean, the actual raw kind of knowledge and learnings and skills that you have, especially as a first time founder, um, you always get better. And you know, most actually founders are or successful founders are second time founders or 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 more than than two times. Um, but on top of the lessons, I think um, bringing those back into a company is very, very uh, highly valued, um, especially I'm seeing with um, hiring managers or companies that tend to be more entrepreneurial. So um, yeah, sometimes I see within big companies, you may find the um, senior engineering leader who has had this you know, 20, 30 years long, very linear career within a tech company. Um, and then another leader who maybe has tried, you know, two or three startups before has gone on and off between startups and corporate world and, and now is at a company. Um, probably the one with entrepreneurial experience will value, you know, and understand and appreciate your background more. Uh, and that's normal because, you know, he went through that. Um, so I think looking for those people and those companies uh, that have more of a entrepreneurial mindset helps and they'll, they're going to value your, your background more. Uh, but I think in general, um, talking about your experience as a startup, but concretely talking about these specific, you know, learnings and things you went through, uh, I found even in interviews or conversations with the uh, hiring managers very helpful. So I think that's probably the the, the best takeaway and investment that you can do when you do a company. Um, you know, doing a company financially, it's probably a bad idea, so I wouldn't recommend it, especially a venture scale company. Um, so I think the financial aspect is always, to me, the last one. It's more you know, the learnings and the skills that you're building, um, potentially even if you want to, to do it again in the future, um, and um, and how they position you for, you know, the next step in your career. So always thinking about um, not only your next job, but your next next job. Sometimes, you know, people talk about, uh, so kind of to align yourself to with, with those skills. So yeah, I think in short, I think it's, they're helpful skills. People are going to appreciate them, especially people that went through a startup experience and hiring managers that went through a startup experience. Um, and um, yeah, hopefully that's helpful. I have many other thoughts, but I think that's kind of the summary of what I'm what I'm seeing in the market right now. Thank you. Um, and by the way, not all companies, you know, are or need to be venture scale companies. I don't know if you guys are thinking about 
raising money or building those type of companies, but obviously, you know, um, it, it's a very specific type of company that needs the type of funding and scale and, you know, kind of goals that, that align with a successful um, venture scale outcome, right? And um, so maybe at the end, if you're interested, we can talk about that, but, uh, you know, I work with, you know, startups here in, in the Bay and, um, you know, every year there's four or five companies that are actually going to become successful exits and, you know, like real, like big multi-billion dollar companies. Uh, there's only four or five, but there's thousands being built. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's very competitive. It's for the most part, you're going to fail. And, um, and then not all companies are, you know, or can, or it's the right time for them to scale to that extent. Um, and for Curio, for example, for, for Curio, I think one of the, the biggest challenges for us was to um, to be able to follow that growth tra trajectory that a venture scale company requires while introducing something new in healthcare, which is by definition, you know, very slow, sales cycles are very slow and um, um, and the demand, especially on the provider side and the healthcare system side, um, requires a lot of training and education and it's going to be very slow, right? So how are you achieve that type of scale. And a lot of times it turns out that, you know, for the timing right now, maybe your idea is not, is that it's not going to scale at a PC, you know, uh, venture capital type outcome. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, but I'll touch on that in a, in a second too. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, let me touch quickly on, I don't know how you're, we're doing on time, but uh, I'll talk quickly about lessons from health tech. Um, so these are, Things that I learned in the last, you know, two and a half, three years, um, I'm only talking about very specific healthcare and maybe bio uh, challenges, you know, that you find in this specific industry and domain. Some of them apply to broader tech, but these are the ones that I noticed are quite different and domain specific compared to you know, your typical kind of, you know, building within a software tech company, uh, B2B SaaS, or the things that I used to do before, you know. Uh, uh, moving into healthcare. So when it was at LinkedIn or when it was at Raise. Um, okay, so the main specific challenge is when you build a company, there's you know, two things that you're doing, basically 95, ideally, percent of your time. Um, don't go to conferences, don't do the stuff that doesn't matter. Or I mean, at least if you need customers later on. But uh, I think, you know, one, build product, good products that people want and love. And two, find distribution and sell it, right? Um, so on the product side, I think for healthcare specifically, um, it's very hard to attract talent. Uh, I think a lot of, I mean, especially I think the talent in the Bay Area, uh, you know, are very talented engineers that really like to build uh, dev tools and AI agents and, you know, very technical things that apply to their life. Um, so they're kind of biased to those specific areas or maybe uh, FinTech, right? Because, um, you know, payments makes money and it's a good business. Um, I think healthcare is seen as a very complex, and I'll talk mostly about the US. I think Italy and Europe is a little different, but uh, it's a very complex system. People, I mean, even I, you know, shy away because of the complexity, because we don't come from the domain and there's a huge barrier of even learning how the system works. Um, so I think there's, there's, there's obviously kind of barriers to entry for uh, technical people, especially engineers, to even consider getting into the space and succeeding in it. So that's been a challenge that I've seen. Um, there's a bunch of technical challenges. I actually have a whole slide on that that I'll talk about. Um, finding users and getting feedback. Uh, you know, in healthcare, users are called patients, right? Uh, so it's it's not as easy as doing uh, you know SEO or a typical sales motion for a for a SaaS company. Uh, it's all about really interjecting yourself in the flow of care, finding, you know, the right stakeholder, the right time in the user journey, where to sell your product, where to offer your product, um, and, and how to get, you know, volume of feedback enough to be able to either it on product in early days, I think that's very hard to do, especially in healthcare. Um, and identifying that initial target market and population, uh, you know, healthcare population, very hard to do. You know, sometimes you're building a horizontal kind of, um, platform like uh, for healthcare uh, to support a bunch of use cases, you know, what is the initial population uh, geography condition that you're going after you want to optimize for, and then, you know, kind of build out from there. How do you identify that? And what are the stakeholders that help you um, get to those, to that population? I think it's, it's quite different to doing healthcare. Um, yeah, maybe in wellness a little easier, you know, you could build your, um, I don't know, wearable and make assumptions on, 
uh, user persona that has enough, you know, uh, tax saviness and money to buy your wearable and kind of start from that, you know, kind of segment of market. I think it's a little easier. Um, I think in healthcare, potentially harder if you're building something like a, maybe a, a verticalized kind of VHR or something like that. Um, science is hard and very expensive. Uh, so this is important, especially for early stage startups. Um, you know, we ended up spending, I would say a third of the capital we raised only on science. Uh, maybe especially because we were doing brand new research on your new treatments. Uh, so that was something that we had to do and we wanted to do and it was um, ethical and very important to do. Um, so we had you know full-time people on the team just publishing and building science and working on randomized control trials and working with uh, IRBs, which are you know these companies you work with that help you set up the trials. Um, all of that is, is very expensive. You need a whole new um, vertical within a company, a science team to execute on that. So you need to fragment the team with a dedicated science team to achieve that. Uh, you can outsource, but I think outsourcing is also very hard, especially with IRBs. Um, on the psychedelic, uh, in the psychedelic space, we had a lot of trouble even finding the right IRBs that had enough experience to help us, uh, you know, uh, publish the science and achieve those results. Uh, so that's a very unique thing to have here. Uh, so that's, those are some on the product side. On the distribution side, you know, how to find the market. Uh, again, finding patients, very hard. Finding buyers, um, even harder probably because uh, in healthcare, you know, you don't have uh, maybe one buyer persona, one ICP, you have five or six. Uh, so you have, you know, providers, healthcare providers, uh, you know, therapists or doctors. You have systems, uh, hospital systems, you have insurances, uh, you have employers, or you have pharma. So you have so many different, you know, stakeholders that may want to buy your products. Um, where do you start from? What, which one is the most appropriate one? How do you start to them? Each of these has a very different um, sales cycle pitch that you want to do to them, um, timing, you know, we worked with pharma, it takes, um, you know, a year and a half or two to close a contract. Uh, it takes maybe six months to brainstorm on an idea of what to work on before you even, you know, start building something with them. Um, for a startup that has, you know, 12 months or 18 months runway, um, very tricky to do, very hard to do. You have to find strong partners that are able to be maybe even entrepreneurial within pharma to be able to support you, you know, get there. Um, or keep pharma for like later on when you have more more money and more time. Um, so typically what happens is they see other companies start with um, maybe providers or systems. And then over time, they notice that it's too slow or they push back. And if they don't get into those, then they try with employers. And I think employers is very interesting. Um, the U.S. is very different than Italy. So I, I think, I don't know if that, that applies to you guys, but, you know, employers in the U.S., the system is kind of messed up. Uh, if you need, if you Obviously, you need insurance. If you want insurance, um, most people get it through their employer, right, as a benefit. Um, and so, so it actually turns out that employers are probably the only stakeholder that has money and also cares enough about the patient to be wanting to look for uh, solutions, even you know, innovative and technological solutions to help their employee base. And so that's why a lot of healthcare companies, especially in the U.S., um, start their go-to-market, at least in the first few years, with employers, because that's where they get the initial you know, funding and money and traction to get to get patients from. Uh, and so that's why you find a bunch of, uh, you know, even mental health companies like, you know, Lira Health or one of these that um, uh, they started with employers and, you know, uh, they have a huge benefits uh, uh, market there. Um, so go to market, you know, go to market, typically you choose uh, or, you know, you identify your go to market. If you're a SaaS product, you do B2B. Uh, if you're a consumer product, you go, go to C. Um, for healthcare, your C is your patient. And the question becomes, you know, how do you get to the patient, right? Uh, and so a lot of times it's people getting creative and they find all kinds of ways to to do that. Um, so other people try this. Um, and if you do healthcare, you'll probably end up doing this, which is B to B to C, which is, you know, you find your kind of partner provider and then you get a flow of patients through them. And so you build this pretty complex um sales cycle or you know, distribution market, uh, grow market where um, you convince the value uh, about the value of the provider and then you got to flow patients through them and then you have some way to to pay back the provider, hopefully using you know, insurance coverage and things like that. Uh, and there's probably even more acronyms that we can look at. Um, incentive systems, I think are very different in healthcare. Um, a lot of these different stakeholders have different, obviously, optimization goals and functions. 
um, um, sometimes, you know, when you sell to a provider, you want to make them more productive and save their time, but they're going to tell you, oh, but insurance pays me X for the time I spend on billing. So why would I want to save time on that and things like that? So yeah, I think there's a lot of incentives between stakeholders that you want to at least be aware of and, and build around or solve for, uh, which probably wouldn't be the case in a traditional kind of B2B SaaS, uh, SaaS space. Um, the other one that I saw in psychedelics was, you know, oh, now we have this treatment that helps people um, pretty much mitigate or, or cure or temporarily help with their depression within a month. Um, let's try that instead of putting them on SSRIs for, you know, many, many years. Uh, and how do you justify that to, say, uh, pharma companies that, you know, has these people on, on these drugs for a long time, right? Uh, so those are some of the incentives that are very hard to break in health here. Uh, and as, like I said, I think sales cycles are extremely long in, in health. And so just account for that. Uh, regulatory wise, obviously, uh, that's a big one for us. It was huge. Uh, but the thing is these constraints, they keep changing over time. Um, for us, telemedicine rules during COVID, they got way easier and better because of COVID. And so they introduced a law that was helpful for that. And then last year, they kind of, um, either took it away or, or added more constraints or reduced kind of the, the, the freedom that that law during COVID used to give. And so that's why, you know, all this wave of startups needs to respond to the market because these regulatory kind of new new laws and rules are, are changing all the time. Um, okay, on the technical side, I know you guys are all engineers. So this is maybe even more interesting or hopefully helpful. Uh, so I think on the traditional healthcare side, um, you know, one question is how do you find the surface, define the surface area of a healthcare MVP? Um, it's very different, right? It's um, when you're building for healthcare, you and probably you work with a physician or someone in the space, um, they're gonna ask you for 50 or, you know, 10, 20 different modules to be part of the systems from day one, because they need, you know, chat and messaging and scheduling and revenue um, cycle management. So how do you really, you know, streamline and slim down uh, your initial products to validate your kind of core value prop. Um, when to support, especially care delivery or or some of these systems, um, it's a pretty wide kind of surface area that you have to cover. Uh, so you have to go think about, you know, what do I build? What do I buy? What do I don't build? And just, you know, keep it for later and, and try to validate this in the market without some of these uh, extra components that I know down the line are probably going to be needing. Um, and some, some of those typically are, you know, EHRs uh, to support the provider or patient experiences to support um, you know, scheduling and, and, and kind of user journey on the patient side and the integration between the two. So the kind of two typical areas that people end up building for uh, interop between systems, uh, data models, data standards, APIs in the US, uh, I don't know if it's global, now we have FHIR, which is becoming slowly you know, standard for modeling uh, data models in, in the healthcare domain. Um, so that one is promising, but I think you know, people are slowly moving there. Uh, there's still a lot of, lot of issues, systems talking to each other, or having to rewrite or being rewritten uh, to follow things like fire. Uh, so that's a big one, especially with you know, legacy systems like, like, like healthcare. Um, data privacy, security, HIPAA, and this becomes a problem for a startup because the question is how, do, how, how much money and time do I want to invest in these things from you know, day one when I have maybe one test user or 10. Uh, and these things get pretty pricey uh, as an investment you know, early on. Uh, and so what is the sweet spot between you know, me rolling out maybe a simple BAA agreement with uh, Google Cloud or AWS, uh, you know, the first couple of months that we're working on an MVP to at least have basic, you know, HIPAA coverage. Uh, but then down the line, when we get to maybe a seed, um, really um, double down on, on on security and do a full audit and maybe do a you know a full kind of compliance audit with a uh, sub two and HIPAA compliant vendor and all of that. But that's in the you know ten to twenty grand type kind of range of, of investment. So you know how do you kind of plan a timeline to account for that? Uh, and with AI, you know, how do you do that? HIPAA compliant and where do you keep the data? Uh, that's a huge problem that everyone in healthcare is dealing with right now. Um, revenue cycle management. Um, the challenge with payments in healthcare is it's not as simple as, you know, you bill someone, they pay with Stripe or credit card and, and that's it. 
um, is there's you know these guys in the middle. It's there's um, insurances, there's clearing houses, the process the payments. Um, a lot of times the statements are on you know PDFs or 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 they they're not you know matching with each other or they're missing fields or they're missing procedures that were built. Um, so how do you go build or buy a system that's able to handle? all of that and the reconciliation with claims and prior authorization and all of that with insurance uh, and gets back to the patient, the actual bill, right? So it's way more complex than uh, I think typical payments in a, in a like B2B SaaS or consumer company. Um, okay, a lot of you had questions on AI, so I'll briefly touch on that and then um, I'll keep some time at the end for more questions, but uh, typical questions that I see all companies are kind of dealing with, you know, do I do local models versus cloud model, models? Where do I keep the data? data? Um, are local models you know good enough today to to be able to support healthcare use cases? Um, hallucinations, safety, human in the loop. In a lot of um, in other cases, we try to keep the um, provider, you know, the therapist or the doctor, in the loop so they get to review the results or the output of the uh, artificial intelligence before it goes to the patient. Uh, so that's a bunch of this work we did at Curio where. We would do everything with AI, you know, people would scan a medical document uh, with, you know, their phone, the scan would be parsed and interpreted and summarized and, uh, and everything by an AI, but then the results would go for review to a doctor that then would just, you know, edit or approve and, and then it would go to the patient. So uh, just to give that layer of verification and safety, but also make it, you know, much more productive for the doctor to, uh, to do their work and save their time. Uh, so a lot of that I think is going on in the space. Uh, how do you do a retrieval of mental generation on vetted knowledge? So knowledge that's, you know, medical was curated and vetted by the hospital or the system and it's kind of, you know, constrained and it's not the, the open internet. Um, and, and how do you do that? And then from a user inter interaction and interface, I think it's very interesting to think about, um, do I collect patient data or medical data through traditional forms like we used to do, you know, uh, or like a type form or whatever, some uh, HIPAA compliant form. Um, or is the new interface more like a Q&A search where I type a question like a perplexity and I get an answer and maybe it's an AI curated answer uh, with, you know, all the implications of that. Uh, or maybe it's more like a chat or or, or something else. Uh, so I think there's a lot of different experimentation with, uh, with user interface that's going on right now. And we tried a bunch of that as well. Uh, and then how do I test for, you know, regressions and models, versions changing and the impact that that has on, on the patient experience. Um, okay, a few more challenges that go very quick because I think we're almost the time. Um, if you do tech-enabled services, um, they're hard. Uh, tech-enabled services means, you know, this is a primarily a service business. You do care delivery. You have, like I used to do, a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, coaches or therapists or physicians on the team that you have to pay and they deliver care to the to the patient. That is, that is, that's a very, you know, human bound, um, resource intensive, non-scalable, non, you know, low margin uh, endeavor. And so I think to keep in mind, focus on the risking business model and distribution first. I think a lot of times you start building a lot of tech to enable the services, but then you are bound to a business model not scaling enough or, you know, the volume of patients not scaling as much as you want. Um, we build a bunch of tech and then the psychedelic demand from providers wasn't scaling at the pace that we potentially could support. So always thinking about, um, I mean, do we think, you know, obviously things that don't scale initially, building some tech to make the experience better, but really focusing on validating the market and the business first. Uh, so don't overbuild. Check your margins because they're going to be significantly affected by the service, you know, labor part. Um, even though you have some technology, especially if the technology doesn't really help scale the services. Um, until AI agents take over, right? this is pretty exciting. I think a lot of that will happen in the next few years. It's um, you know, software has been eating the world in the last twenty years or more. Um, if and when AI agents become a thing, I think they're going to slowly be taking over some of the time and effort that today we use humans for delivering services, right? Um, so if that happens and eventually it'll probably happen, that's where this idea of tech-enabled services changes a lot because then it's not anymore a tech-enabled service, it's a 
it's a tech service, it's an AI service. You know, it's maybe there's humans in the loop, but it's primarily a, a very scalable kind of tech driven, um, uh, very low marginal, zero marginal cost type type company and type product, right? So that I think changes the, the unit economics of, uh, uh, of the tech enabled service a lot. So keep an eye on that. Uh, on the regulatory front, they make or break you. So be careful, they force you to pivot. So it's hard to you know predict pivots, but um, at least being aware, having self-awareness and doing research on what are the regulatory frameworks and rules that affect my company and how potentially uh, are prone to change are they gonna be in the future? Um, and then the, I think the intersection of healthcare and tech, which is health tech is, is very interesting because you know, healthcare is legacy, slow, risk averse, complex, human bound. And tech is kind of the opposite is um, innovative and fast and risk prone, built on scalable systems. So I think the best of both, both worlds is when you build these companies where you put people from both sides working together and then you find a way, which is a win-win to really make them productive and successful. But that's also the challenge of these companies. I think it's healthcare people come with their expertise, a lot of times they're not tech savvy. They have never built, you know, technical product before. Uh, tech product, tech people understand how to build software, product, maybe hardware. Uh, know very little about healthcare and the jargon from healthcare and how the system works. Um, so really building these, you know, layers of communication and interactions within the company to be able to uh, to share knowledge and, and work together. I think that's a, initially a very hard kind of boundary to to get over and, and make work compared to maybe a tech company where you have you know, product managers working with engineers. And I think there's a lot more kind of understanding from day one and it's, it's easier to work with. So, uh, but if you can make it work, I think it's amazing. It's just, uh, I think it takes more intentional effort there. Um, I'll touch on, maybe I'll just show you the trends and then I'll ask you which ones you're more interested about and I can talk about those. Um, so future trends that I'm excited about. Um, so in the wearable space, um, I have a lot of you know companies and, and people and friends working on EG. I think EG, I think, is very exciting, especially to make uh, mindfulness and emotions more visible and trackable, and you know see progress. Um, CGMs, you know, obviously they've been around for a while. New new biomarkers like lactate or few those are coming out, and increasingly they're going to come out. Um, using personal health LLMs or ways to really take the output, the data from the wearable and um, um, really create, you know, plans and coaching and suggestions longitudinally with a bunch of data, like time series and data points um, that you gather from these continuous uh, monitoring devices and make them explainable and educational. I think it's very exciting today. I mean, I think it's even aura ring or, you know, things like that, people buy them to look at the data maybe once or twice, but they don't really make strong action habits around them. Uh, so I think it's started for that. Um, remote monitoring and coaching, um, especially when you can maybe have, you know, that LLM inform a physician or someone on the other side that can help create a plan or give suggestions or give feedback or even monitor people uh, remote. Uh, integrating some of these vitals and things that you have maybe on the watch at the OS level. I think Apple is probably, you know, very well positioned there, maybe more than startups, but I think it's pretty exciting. On the mindfulness side, uh, so EEG for feedback and progress, breathwork, I think it's super interesting. There's a bunch of companies that are working on tracking and delivering breathwork experiences. Uh, meditation interactively with a group of people, I think it's an interesting space. Um, AI meditation is what I try to do with uh, Medito, um, which is, you know, meditations that are dynamically personalized and generated for you instead of being like a library of static pre-recorded things that are, that are offered to you like Headspace. Um, and VR meditation, these new, new ways to kind of create a virtual world. I think we'll, we'll get there in a few years, but probably still early days. The, the ones that I tried so far are not, not that good. Uh, in mental health, new tech for patients and providers, um, obviously psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, I think that'll take some more time. Uh, like timing wise, but super exciting. Uh, you know, this year MDMA for treating PTSD is most likely gonna get approved. So it's gonna be a huge change for veterans and people suffering from PTSD. Um, and then things like tax-based therapy or new ways to deliver uh, mental health coaching and therapy. Um, and then finally in health tech, um, I think the most exciting things are the personal health LMs, 
um, things like radiology, you know, people using AI to create summaries and recommendations for radiologists or uh, just making their work faster, better, more reliable, more productive. Things like after visit summaries, uh, you know, uh, recording visits and transcribing them and creating insights. Uh, new types of EHRs and more modern, more developer friendly. Uh, I think a lot of that is happening right now. Uh, the problem with the EHRs, there's a lot of uh, regulatory capture uh, um, at the regulatory side. So, I mean, they've been slow to win the market because of that. Um, and then whatever tech we can build to automate, especially small medical practices, things like um, revenue cycle, you know, payments, um, insurance, um, everything that really helps people manage their own practice with the advantage of having um, um, low marginal costs and scaling up uh, compared to having to uh, to hire, you know, a lot of people to run accounting or uh, other functions within a, within a company. Uh, and new incentives models like value-based care. So this is things like uh, really optimizing for um, and charging for the value that the care provides instead of the amount of treatments or procedures that you that you build for, and you know, which creates a very kind of uh, negative incentives or you know outcome on the patient. Um, that's not the case today in the U.S. I think this this is more of a vision, and some people are working on it, but it's pretty early days. But I'm excited for that. Um, and General Catalyst, some uh, VC company, um, they bought recently a healthcare system to be able to operate and and help their startup, you know, deliver and deploy very innovative tech solutions in a healthcare system, in a hospital. Uh, so this venture uh, capital company um, is working on that as a new model to really experiment in a faster, closer to the patient startup development cycle model where you actually get to work with the, with the system directly. So I think that's, uh, that's pretty exciting. Um, so to summarize, careers and startups are messy. Uh, so take calculated risks and bets. Um, mission driven means you know finding purpose and impact and aligning work with your personal values. Um, all careers can be mission driven. You don't have to work in you know healthcare or climate. Uh, you can do it in every domain. I think it's more about self awareness and really um, um, be self aware of the pull and the interest that you have towards a specific mission or purpose. Uh, and then for health tech, uh, it's even messier than startups normally are. So just be aware of that and you know. There's a lot of learnings there that you can leverage from, from other people. Um, but it's also ripe with opportunities and a very exciting future. So I hope you know more, more of you and more people get to get to work on it and, and learn about it. Um, and I think that's all I had. I went a little over time, but happy to take any questions. I think we're gonna have a few. So there are at least a couple in the chat, but I know that because of the last things that you touched, there are gonna be more. <laughs> Okay, let's do it. Um, I'll go. I'll go top to bottom. So, how do you manage to adapt to a startup environment? Um, uh, actually, do you mind, uh, Alberto? Do you wanna? Yeah, yeah. Actually, or, uh, uh, the the probably you have already answered the uh, the first uh, okay. question because it's the one that I asked the uh, in uh, the first okay. half, uh, but. Yeah, I had uh, other two questions in the chat, so I'll go yeah. for the first one. So it's, uh, how do you recruit uh, uh, physicians on the, how do you start uh, working with uh, physicians in uh, such uh, uh, in, in such an innovative field from one uh, point of view of the startup tech uh, point of view and uh, from the other point of view, it's really conservative. It, uh, regulation is uh, strong and uh, will be is even stronger here in Europe. So, uh, how do you overcome the stigma? And uh, so, I wanted to know more about your personal uh, story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, the stigma you mean about uh, mental health, psychedelics, or in general, um, the yeah, stigma about specifically general... for the psychedelic work. Well, not. Not uh, just that, but uh, probably more in general with the healthcare system uh, that is really conservative, such as uh, using okay, because uh, they don't want to change that. Mm, yeah. LLMs uh, is uh, it, it's mm, still sure. very <laughs> not well seen. Yeah. yeah, yeah, got it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so I think that the, the 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 first answer that I would give is you have to find your um, you know, call them sponsors or you know, super uh, users or you know, whatever 
person within a system or or, or provider, um, whether you know is open to change as an entrepreneurial mindset, maybe they are. Uh, they come from a background that you know uh, is maybe startups, but now, like for example, just to be very concrete, um, our POC, our uh, point of contact in uh, pharma, in one of the big pharma companies that we used to work with, um, was this guy that um, joined these pharma companies but before had done you know two or three startups and was coming from that environment. So I think similar to the feedback I gave you earlier on when you join a big tech company or a more established company, you look for those you know kind of um, people that are excited about this entrepreneurial kind of startup background. I think you can find the same type of people in healthcare and probably those are going to be the ones that uh, are more open to collaborating with you on testing out uh, more like newer and more inno innovative ideas. Um, and some big companies even have um, innovation departments within them. Uh, so most likely you're going to find those people in those departments within these companies. So, you know, each pharma company has some, uh, some of them even have a startup incubator or some innovation kind of branch department that only works on that. And they have you know, millions of dollars dedicated to only to startups. Um, and then you have to win over, you know, your case over a bunch of competition and other companies that are applying for for that. Um, so yeah, but that's what we ended up doing is finding really those people that resonate with, uh, potentially you have, you know, connections in, in your network where you can get to them. Um, sometimes we even, you know, did a bunch of, travel and went to uh, to meet people. Mostly when I travel, instead of going to very open conferences where you just, you know, meet kind of random people and it's, you know, it's a very large conference, they try to be more targeted. So um, I only go to a conference if I really know that there's one or two people that I want to meet and they think they're going to be helpful. Uh, or I go to, um, for example, one of our, you know, LP or venture capital or portfolio company meetings. Uh, each of them every year does an annual meeting where they invite other companies and also the LPs, which are, you know, the limited pro um, providers that, that, that pull money into the venture, um, the venture capital company. Uh, so in these events, you're probably going to meet LPs that work in healthcare. Some of them are people with a full-time job. They are directors or VPs at hospitals or systems or they had technology there and so you can just you know approach them there and, and talk to them and find ways to work with them thank you my favorite thing you have one yes uh i'll go second while talking about healthcare the user or the final patient is always central so the majority of the things that we are building are actually ending up to the final user so uh, talking about uh, B2C businesses or B2B2C uh, businesses, how much uh, resources uh, should I allocate? And by resources, I mean both economical and human. Should I allocate in the first phases of my startup uh, to the marketing, to getting the people to know the, my service? Uh, and what are you doing at Curio maybe? What, what strategies are you using? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um... Yeah, so, you know, it's obviously experimentation. Every company is different. Uh, for us, we we started actually with a lot of, um, I think on two fronts, actually, we kind of split the effort on, on the provider side, really connecting with um, basically therapies and mental health clinics across the country. Uh, we were operating in uh, seven different states. Um, in the US, each state you operate in, you have to incorporate a company. So we ended up having, you know, a bunch of different entities and it was quite complex but um in each of those seven states that we operated in um we really tried to get to know the clinics and the mental health um providers on the field and and, and talk to them and i think pretty quickly you get a feel for what is the type of potential buyer person that's interested in 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 the product um so i think that's always helpful at least to give you some again market feedback on the response to to the idea that you have or the product um, at the same time, we did a bunch of that on um, on the D2 side, D2C side too. So we did a bunch of you know um, SEO optimization. I think content helps a lot. So um, the more you know online kind of content and blog articles, and especially if you have a niche of knowledge or uh, or a new approach. Or for us, it was about you know uh, psychedelic care. I think at some point we got to number one on Google for at least three or four different keywords or topics, um, just by writing a lot of content and, you know, publishing about it. Uh, our head of science 
talked about some of the science and published around that. Um, so pretty quickly we got there and I think that was more of a, a top of funnel um, entry point for on the provider side for them to run into it and then reach out to us and connect, right? Uh, more so than for patients directly. I mean, we got some patients that, you know, asked questions or found us through that channel, but for us, it was really more about um, showcasing the, the knowledge and these new type of therapies and the science about them and the evidence uh, to providers to get them interested in, in working with us. Uh, so a lot of the SEO and the optimization there was on, on the provider side to, to get them interested. Uh, and there's, you know, I was highly suggest one of the highest leverage things that I've uh, ever done was to really learn how to do, and now with AI is changing, but, you know, do SEO optimization and some of the kind of basic things to, to get good at marketing and, um, and, uh, and really targeting, you know, the right people on and creating content for that and optimizing opt optimizing your site um because it does it does help uh, we were never able to get i think a reliable recurrent stream of patients coming through that so i think it's always more um it's more on the provider side to to get them to you know to get interested in conversations um but that's where initially you know at the same time you'll need to do a lot of uh, cold calling and um and really you know kind of sales sales led um more so the product led type type motions yeah thank you you're welcome is there any other question any other questions i i still have a question but uh, if someone else wants to go first uh... okay then okay. Thank you, Alberto. I'll go because uh, I have actually a question related to the one Matteo did. So uh, always in the, let's say in the setting on building a model based on B2C rather than B2B. And uh, before you said that, um, especially in the US, uh, the employers are the ones actually interested in uh, let's say buying services targeted at healthcare or wellness for their employees. But I wonder how is it perceived this thing from uh, an employee point of view? Because uh, maybe as you said, it's kind of a cultural difference, but we actually, me and uh, uh, my partners, we actually uh, ask this question to other people and we always received like contrasting answers like for some it's received as a uh an okay thing from uh let's say em us employees uh, because they just have the opportunity and that's all and it's fine while for others it's more like an imposition from the employers that is kind of mm. invading the employees uh, personal space so i just wanted to mm. have your your opinion Wow, yeah, thank you. No, that's super interesting. So a couple of thoughts as you were talking. Um, so I think number one is, um, yes, I think in the US, um, it's almost a given that you know, your employer, employer will offer uh, almost like a whole portfolio of perks and benefits, right? Um, to the point where, you know, I think most of these things, actually, you don't go sell individually to the company, but you go through brokers. Um, so things like, you know, Sequoia benefits or you know, there's a bunch of them, um, you end up accessing as an employee, all of these through a single portal where all of the benefits are, you know, there and, you know, I have a lot of friends doing, you know, therapy and they have their own app that they download and they have all of their, you know, self-guided mindfulness, uh, meditation practices. And also their therapist calls and transcripts and, uh, and all of that is offered by, uh, you know, one of these companies, but work like offer distributed through the through the benefits provider that the company chooses, right? Um, uh, but then it's it's pick and choose. It's not that um, you have to use them all or you have to use any of them. Uh, it's it's very much kind of an open benefit that the company provides. Um, but a lot of times I've seen companies that don't offer them uh, being asked by employees, you know, oh, like you know we're missing the mindfulness or the the therapy benefit and things like that. Um, so, so hopefully that'll change in Italy, and I'm not, I don't know the, the the market there enough to to know how things operate. But if you don't see that, I I would hope, hopefully that's a trend that you can kind of build on, and you know it's it's gonna change. You can kind of bet on in the future, um, because here I think it's it's almost a given to the point where I think now the challenge here is there's too many you know point solutions 
uh, that are being sold to the employer. And it's almost like um, um, uh, just too much noise and it's, it's hard for the employer to, to pick the, you know, the right offerings and evaluate if you have five different mental health providers, you know, which one is the most relevant to our or, or useful one. Uh, but that's where I think the broker does a bunch of the work. And then the question becomes, okay, how do you sell into the broker? Um, so that's one thought. The other one that I think that you touched on that was interesting was on the uh, data privacy or, you know, kind of sharing employee data side. Um, so that was a tricky one. I think, uh, you know, I, um, for example, Aura, uh, you know, Aura Ring, um, uh, not technically health, healthcare, it's more, you know, wearable. Um, it took them a long time and I, and I talked to them and I know them um, to get into the workplace because they had to tailor the product and um, um, slim down and, and remove some of the features to be able to get into the workplace. Uh, so they build things like, you know, uh, you have a circle of employees on a team that all have the ring and uh, they can see each other's metrics, but they're not to the number of hours that you slept and heart rate level type data or HRV. It's more overall kind of very high level trends and you know uh, team sentiment and um, energy levels and things that are much higher levels so then you don't get to the granularity of you know uh, being too invasive or even letting the employer kind of monitor things or um, so that's one way you stream down the product just for for employer the other one is um, um, you just offer a whole different thing into the workplace um, yeah, you, you find ways basically to to tailor the products to to what the you know to what the corporate kind of environment, or you even create a layer of privacy where you don't allow the employer to um, to track the identity of the employee uh, while you know they still receive the full product experience. So that's another probably uh, approach to consider is um, can you anonymize your, you know, user data and, and offer that so that uh, you just remove the problem completely and you give a great experience while not allowing for any um, tracking or, you know, um, surveillance type things. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Hopefully that helps. Uh, well, then I go with the... <laughs> So I have a question okay. more on the trends uh, and especially on uh, LLMs uh, that uh, are applied to healthcare systems. So initially I had uh, a, a question on uh, uh, what is the, the trustability level uh, that uh, is uh, safe for uh, clinical uh, use? So uh, at the moment, regulation is uh, is not really catching up on <laughs> on these uh, on these systems uh, uh, globally. Uh, but uh, is uh, do you think that uh, in the future, rag systems uh, and uh, uh, fine tuning of uh, the models uh, will be on a clinical uh, vetted data will be enough, or do you think that uh, uh, training uh, our own uh, models uh, will be instead uh, much more? Uh, <laughs> reliable to the highs of uh, creation of an hospital that has uh, to implement our solution. And uh, in that case, uh, uh, yeah, it, it will be much more costly, much more <laughs> difficult to get, yeah. but uh, uh, at the same time, it also improves explainability. So I had this question, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a great question. I think, you know, it's a topic that's uh, top of mind. I think if I walk down the street and talk to anyone, they're probably, you know, talking about LLMs in uh, in some space, like right now. It's, it's very, you know, everyone's working on it. I think it's it's not a sole problem. I can give you maybe the two or three approaches that I'm hearing, you know, in, in, from people or companies in this space. Um, it's, so I think for healthcare is, I mean, today what people are doing is mostly um, anonymizing locally as much as they can, going out to an LLM and using Azure, you know, HIPAA compliant open AI wrapper or things like that. Um, that, you know, that is kind of the starting point. Um, I do think, you know, as models get better and smaller and local, um, especially for things like summarizing text, um, there's no reason why you need to go to a server to do that. Um, so, so from a privacy perspective, I think that will probably change. It, it seems like a pretty, pretty simple, you know, requirement for for those um, um i think for those that are more using broader knowledge or you know re larger requirements on context um maybe you may have to go out and similar to you know the things that apple is doing locally versus uh server-based i think that that applies as well the consideration between um uh, 
the size of the model and the capabilities and some things you're going to be able to do locally, some things you may have to go out to a server-based, you know, larger model to be able to achieve. Um, I think for healthcare, it's important that the, the data set is, you know, curated and high quality. Um, and, and that is the one thing that maybe helps you in healthcare because, um, uh, you know, unlike uh, a perplexity that needs to, you know, index the entire internet and then um, create this answer or question answer engine where, uh, you know, they embed the entire internet and then they match it to your query, they summarize it and give you back an answer, right? I think in, in healthcare, it's more, um, you probably have a more narrow use case where the knowledge base, you can kind of curate, you can have a bunch of, you know, medical resources, you can have a bunch of medical knowledge, um, uh, you can, you know, a bit human curated or, or AI generated and you can embed it, but basically you have this very constrained kind of high quality, hopefully data sets, um, then, then you can run the LLM on. And so that's where I think it gets interesting to have a, a personal health LLM or things like that, where I think that the, the context window and the content of it is so high quality and constrained that the output potentially is going to hallucinate, but at least in the data is higher quality. So it should, you know, it should be a little better. So I think that's what we've seen. A lot of the products that we built were only running on a few thousands internal, you know, documents and resources and things that the, the providers created. So that actually worked really well, especially for Q&A, for things like a search, um, that actually works pretty well. Um, I would imagine for things like uh, uh, longitudinal data or coaching or providing recommendations and intelligence, that's where the challenge begins because, you know, there could be more mistakes. Um, and so that's why you see things like, um, actually, I highly recommend there's a paper from last week. Um, I think it's called Towards a Personal Health LLM uh, from Google, Google Health. Um, they uh, they actually worked on two things. One was um, um, fine-tuning an LLM for medical data, and the other one was uh, experimenting with an agent that's multi-step and is able to reason on health data. So I think those are very, very early days experimentation on, you know, how do you do this in a, in a safer way without making mistakes and, and be able to actually deliver insights and reasoning around the whole data set of medical data. But that's, I think it's very kind of experimental early days. Um, but for Q&A and search, I think if you have a high quality data set, you're probably, probably can do good results today. Thank you. Is there any other question from the audience? Because otherwise I think that we can thank our speaker and we can close the special tour and the recording here. So I'd like to thank you all. Thank you, Matteo, again for the really uh, interesting tour providing us a lot of, um, a lot of food for thoughts, I would say. Things that we have to re-elaborate a little bit more, we need some more time, I, I think, to, to really appreciate all the things that you share with us. And um, I, I do really like to thank you all for all the insightful information and vision that you share with us, not only with respect to men and tech, but also with respect to the career path that all those students can, can experience in a few months or years, I would say. So thank you all once more and see you for the next next special talks. Awesome.